Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. And go! Action! Magic! Hey, everybody, how's it going? I'm Jimmy Wong. You're listening to the Command Zone. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. We're, uh, Josh, you're not next to me right now. What's going on, man? I know, and it's kind of annoying, actually. We've turned into LR, where Josh is the Luis Scott Vargas of this show. He's somewhere else Skyping in. Yeah, I'm at work, unfortunately. I have to Skype in from work what? because it's a late night. What time is it, by the way? Oh, it's uh, 9.30. 9.30 at work, Josh Lee Kwai. Uh, clearly, you're working on the podcast, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah, the worst part is we'll get done recording this. I'll go back to work, and maybe I'll get off about 2 or 3. Oh, and uh I do not work a night shift, ladies and gentlemen. No, I started at 8 a.m. this morning. It's just going to be one of those weeks. Um, yeah. Anybody who works in the biz knows about days like these. It's no big deal. Yep. The uh, They call it the grind. The uh, yep. It's the same with like the game industry, too. It's like when Halo, whatever, is coming out, everyone at Blizzard or wherever they make that game, Bungie just stays there for a billion years. Wow, look at my knowledge. Just I'm just hitting my head against the table right now. They all start dropping with this, knowledge. Dropping drop knowledge. knowledge. Blizzard, Bungie, uh, they're all the same. They're not. So uh, um, we got an exciting show. We're going to do the Magic Origins set review. Um, all right. We're not going to review every card. We're just going to review the cards that we think will have some sort of impact on EDH. Mm-hmm. But we have an exciting announcement. Yeah. Uh, a few a few exciting announcements before we get into the main topic. Um, the first one is... It's our first year alive. It's our birthday. It's the Command Zone's birthday. Yeah, we are one yeah. year old. That's kind of crazy. That is crazy. Actually, I'm going to go look at our original, uh, our original posting here. And, uh, oh boy, we've come quite a ways. We talk about this occasionally. I haven't had the heart to go back and listen to our original episodes, but you have, Josh. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it, Jimmy. Don't do it. <laughs> you will face palm hot, big time. Big time, yeah. Um, the uh, the all new Command Zone podcast is your weekly source for all things Commander, aka EDH, a multiplayer Magic the Gathering format with hosts Jimmy Wong and Josh Lee Kwai. All right, guys. That's our f- that's our first episode summary. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a focus on all aspects of gameplay and strategy, from table politics, budget builds to deck building, and more. I think we've covered all those. I think we were true to our word. Yeah, definitely um, the budget builds part because we, we always bring up stuff about, except for our high rollers episodes, of course. <laughs> uh, it's been crazy. I can't believe we're at a year. Um, this is going to be episode number 63, yes, I believe. Yes, I think so. Yeah, 63. It'll be next Tuesday. Yep. Um, so, you know, we skipped a few weeks in there, but then we d- did double episodes on a bunch of weeks. So yeah. we're ahead of the 52 uh, episodes. I don't know. It's been a great year. It's been really cool. We came from sort of nobodies in the community to like throwing our own gatherings in vegas and uh, getting to, <laughs> getting to meet uh, all kinds of people um in different walks of life and a lot of the content creators from uh marshall obviously bdm was on our show we had the brainstorm brewery guys um yeah all kinds of big guests and, and Evan Verhey, got to know. marshall sutcliffe bdm um yeah it's been a lot of fun the mta podcast girls uh you know, I've we've had a couple of people uh, tweet at us and email us and be like, "Don't burn out, guys. We don't want another uh, a Brian Wong situation," uh, which I think is really funny. Um, but we're a year in. I am still we're still picking up steam. I think um, I'm always excited to do the podcast. Uh, we've sort of got it down to a really streamlined uh, sort of. I don't know. Our workflow is good, and uh, I don't know. I I feel great. Yeah, I feel great. Um, but I do appreciate we have had a number of people say don't burn out, guys, because, yeah, we are doing the two episodes a week. And on that note, um, we're only going to be doing one episode this week. <laughs> We've burned so, out. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's directly because of Comic-Con. Yeah, for numerous reasons. One, we just it's going to be a busy week because Josh and I are both headed down to Comic-Con uh, this week, which will have happened last week. Now that you're listening to this podcast on the Tuesday uh, after all the madness. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a busy week. We're only having one episode this week, but that's okay because Jimmy and Josh, I'm talking about myself in the third person for whatever reason, we guested on some other podcasts. So you guys should check that out if you're uh, aiming for a fixin' uh, of Oh yeah, uh, that's Jimmy a really good point. You can get still get sort of even th- an extra episode of us. It's almost like there's three episodes of Command Zone this week. Um, <laughs> I was on the Commander in podcast which will have been i guess released last week when you're hearing this um 
with Phil DeLuca, who used to be on Five Commanders, John Watson, um, Nate. Those guys uh, had me on. It was a really cool episode. We got to talk about some slightly controversial issues. Uh, it was cool. You should definitely check it out. And then, we, Jimmy, you were on The Masters of Modern. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I just happened to be at the offices when Alex and Ben were recording with the one and only Nickelback, Jason Alt. Uh, Nickelback! So, yeah, we talked about the controversial price spikes in Modern right now. And it actually ties into EDH as well because a lot of those cards do get played in our format. So that was a really fun uh, fun time. We just joked around for a bunch. So you can find Commanderin on Twitter at CommanderinMTG and the Master of the Modern at the MMCast. So you guys should just check out those episodes and you'll get the full fill of uh, Jimmy and Josh for the week. Perfect. Very cool. And then before we get into our main topic here, we have one other cool thing. We're doing another book giveaway. Giveaway! Woo! More free stuff! More free stuff. Thank you, Del Ray, for supporting the show. And uh, we have another book. What's it called? The book is called Red Rising. So it's actually came out on paperback on July 7th. So in celebration of that, we are going to be doing a joint contest with Del Ray Spectra. That's, uh, you can find them on Twitter, at Del Ray Spectra. Um, so you can have a chance to win a copy of Red Rising, which is a very good book. I have read it. It's sort of a cross between The Hunger Games and Harry Potter and a little bit of Ender's Game thrown in there. What? It's, it's, that sounds amazing. It's very cool. Um, yeah, really good book. There's actually two books out. Oh, I misspoke. It's not Red Rising that came out on paperback. It's actually the sequel, Golden Sun is the sequel, and that's what came out on paperback. Red Rising's been out on paperback, but... It's not. It wouldn't make sense for us to give out Golden Sun because you have to have read the first book to really, you know, keep up and be uh, know what know what you're reading when you yeah. read the second one. So we're going <laughs> to give away the first book in the series, and then you can go get Golden Sun on paperback after you've read uh, Red Rising. So we're going to do the book giveaway in a similar manner to how we did the last book giveaway. What you'll do is you're going to tweet at us an answer to the following question, or email us. Or you can email us, and then we're going to pick 10 winners, and we will announce those winners on next week's show. Wow, 10 winners? This is We're big time in it now. We're big time in it. Well, Del, <laughs> Del Rey is big time in it. I know, I was they're, just trying to say credit. It. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, what card from Magic Origins are you most excited about, and which of your EDH decks are you putting it into? Ooh, this is going to be a good one. There are a lot of good cards, and we're going to cover all those today, or m hopefully most of them. Hopefully most of them. We'll probably miss some and people will be like, why didn't you talk about that one? Yeah. Um, so, yep, just answer that question. Tweet at us at CommandCast or you can email us CommandCast at RocketJump.com and tell us which Magic Origin card you're most excited about and what EDH deck you're putting it into and then you'll be entered to win a copy of Red Rising. That is super awesome and you guys will have uh, a week to do this. So from the uh, from this podcast to the next. Correct? Yep. All right, cool. We do record generally on Thursday nights, so you're actually only going to have three or four days. <laughs> so basically, when you listen to this, just answer, tweet at us. Don't waste any time. In fact, pause what you're listening to right now. Go tweet at us real quick, and then you can come back and resume. Yep. Unless you're driving. We've talked about this. Do not tweet and drive at the same time, guys. I know the uh, the temptation is real. Yeah, pull over. <laughs> pull, pull over. <laughs> The time now, is on, now. <laughs> legally pull over. Don't like pull over on the side of the freeway. Uh, like exit and then pull over to the side of the road in a legal manner. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on to our main topic. We are talking about Magic Origins. It is our set review. It is going to be super exciting. We've already covered a lot of these cards. In fact, we've covered our spoiler card called the Great Aurora. And we also talked about the dual face planeswalkers in our previous episode, number 59. So we're not going to be mentioning those again. If you guys want to hear about those and our analyses on those, we go pretty in depth. You can check that out on episode 59. All right. Oh, I guess before we start, though, we should talk about the Great Aurora really quickly. It turns out, we've talked to a few judges now, that when you shuffle all your permanents into your library and draw that many cards, it does not count cards in exile, it does not count cards in your graveyard, but it will count tokens. The tokens technically get shuffled in, and they go towards the count of cards you draw eventually, but the tokens themselves just dissipate. But they do count towards the amount of cards you draw. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a so really good point. So Great Aurora, actually very good in token decks. In fact, I would instantly put it into Titania now. Oh, yeah. Um, Holy crap. Yeah. 
because yeah you can wipe the board and draw more cards than anybody else um and titania is a type of deck that has a lot of land in it so you get to put all those land into play free seems good yeah and that deck wants to ramp like crazy so you're going to be able to get a lot of cards in dropping an exploration and stuff too on those later turns yeah for sure all right cool um so we should start with the new legendary creatures. So there were the Planeswalkers, which are the dual face Planeswalkers. Like you said, we talked about them in episode 59. But there are also five other legendary creatures. They're all monocolored uh, in this set. So we should talk about each of those because those have a chance to be your new commanders. Yeah, or in the 99. The first one is called Dwinin Guiltleaf Dayan. I cannot pronounce this. <laughs> There's so many. I think you did pretty good. Okay, sweet. It's two and two green, four total for a three, four legendary creature elf warrior. Elf Tribal gets stoked. It has reach, because uh, it has a bow and arrow, or she has a bow and arrow. Uh, other elf creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever Dwining Guiltleaf Dayan attacks, you gain one life for each attacking elf you control. So Dwining is a lord, and when we say lord in magic, we mean that these cards buff up all other creatures of their uh, of their tribal type, but usually by plus one, plus one. Yeah, or a lord could even be like an outlast lord. It just means mm -hmm. that if 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 other of your creatures meet some criteria, then it buffs all of those. Yeah. Um, this seems pretty good. I, I think it's probably not as good as some of the other um, elf generals that are already out there. Also, yeah. it forces you into mono green, which may or may not be good, but it definitely belongs in an elf deck. And if you're sort of like thinking about building an elf deck and you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of new cards and you get this, you might be able to just start on one. Yeah, this would be a great place to... It, it feels like one of those pre-con, like, this commander is good. It may not be the best, but you can definitely use it for your purposes. Um, I, the other part that I don't like so much about this card is that the gaining one life for each attacking elf is great, but usually in these kind of decks, when you're swinging out, you're swinging for the win. And also, you don't want it to be so conditional on your life gain that you have to be attacking with a lot of um, elf uh, elves attacking. I don't know. It feels a little iffy. To me, the 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 gain life is just sort of uh, incidental. Like mm -hmm. you're really playing this card for the plus one plus one to all your elves. Yeah. Like I said, it's not the best elf uh, general, but you know, it's it's okay if that's all you've got right now. Yeah, and it's definitely great uh, just as another creature in the elf deck that once it hits the board, and you already have two other creatures that are elves that make all your guys plus one plus one. Um, I mean, you're just gonna get giant elves, which is gonna be great. Yeah, for sure. So it's nice to add on to that ability. Okay, the next uh, legendary creature is the red legendary creature. Creatures? Creatures, it's, I guess. Yeah. yeah, it's Pia and Kirin Nalar. So that is Chandra's parents. Hey, um, parents. They are a legendary creature, human artificer. They're a 2-2. When Pia and Kirin enter the battlefield, put two 1-1 one -one colorless Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying onto the battlefield. So you pay four mana and you get a two two plus two one one flyers. That's but pretty then they sweet. Have, yep, they have an activated abil ability that says pay two and a red, sacrifice an artifact. Pia and Kirin deal two damage to target creature or player. Now that is good. That seems pretty good, although three mana is a lot. But uh, so they come in, you get four total power and toughness. You get two flyers. You can turn those two flyers into shocks, mm -hmm. uh, but it costs you three mana. And then you could also sacrifice any other artifacts you happen to have. You don't have to sacrifice the Thopter tokens, yeah. Um, it, which is really good in like the Duretti deck, uh, the Felden deck, maybe those decks that can easily get their artifacts back out of the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think Pia and Kieran are great um, in any of the artifact based decks. I don't think they're really a strong build around me. Um, just because there are generals that already do their that sort of recursion, or, or at least can use the artifacts that they're sacrificing way better. Like Doretti is just much better in a general sense, in in terms of what he can do with artifacts. He and Kieran Nalar are great supporting players in that, but I don't think they're I don't think they made the top tier of a general to build around. Yeah, I totally agree. If you're going to be dealing with a mono red deck or building a mono red deck that's dealing with artifacts, mm -hmm. then there's no reason to use Pia and Kieran Nalar uh, over Doretti, who's just, I think, better. Yeah, agreed. Um, although, interestingly, the sacrificing an artifact, the card itself does the damage, so I believe that counts as commander damage, correct? Uh, commander damage is only combat damage, so unfortunately not. Oh, well, I'm dumb. 
Dumb, dumb, <laughs> dumb. <laughs> We've listen. I've made that mistake on this cast before because it's just one of those things. That, I was just you know, doing it to test you, Josh. Right, right. So we were just <laughs> you were just using it as a gateway to inform our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, also when these car when this car was first spoiled, I think this was the first legendary red creature to be spoiled out of this cycle. People were like, "Oh my gosh, we're gonna get the parent cycle, so we're gonna get the parents of all of the legendary planeswalkers." Um, that would have been sweet. It would have been sweet. I don't know if it w- would have worked Vorthos wise, but it would have been sweet. Uh, okay, you want to read the next one? Yeah, we got Cothoped, Soul Hoarder. It's a 4 and 2 black for a 6 6 flying legendary creature demon. Uh, whenever a permanent owned by another player is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card and you lose one life. Whoa, daddy, this is sweet. Um, Any general that has card draw tacked onto it is pretty great. Yeah. Any card is, that has card draw tacked onto it is great. Yeah, good point, good point. It's a 6-6 six, six flyer. Unfortunately, it costs 6, which is a lot for a commander. Yeah. Um, but the effect is very, very good. Yeah, not to mention that you're going to be the one... Um, I mean, you lose life when you do this. It's a very typical black effect. The only problem is that you can't abuse this yourself because... Well, you can w- combining it with, like, you know, a board wipe that... Um, you know, like our number one black card. Uh, freaking... Toxic Deluge. Yeah, like Toxic Deluge plus Kothobed is great because you just Toxic Deluge for three or whatever, or up to five, and even six, um, and you get to draw turns, tons of cards. It turns all of your board wipes into degrees of pain. Yeah. Um, not to mention it says whenever a permanent owned by another player is put into a graveyard from the battlefield. So that means that if somebody destroys lands or somebody destroys an artifact or enchantment, it's, just, it's not just creatures. So incidentally, you're going to get to just draw a lot of cards. Now you do lose a life every time. I don't think that's very big of a deal because Black's used to that. And all kinds of stuff costs you life. Um, Greed, Erebos. So that's just sort of the way Black does it. I could just see this being so powerful, you know. Yeah. This is a friend to any board wipe. It's great. Uh, I mean, the only problem is that you could potentially kill yourself with it, um, just because. Someone... Or somebody could kill you. They could look at you and go, "Oh, you're at eight life. I'll just make you draw eight cards." Oh no, no, I'll just kill my eight of my own permanents. Does it say may? Uh, no, nope. no, nope. it's you not have to a may ability. Card, yeah. That's interesting. They might be at a point where they could board wipe just to kill you, even though yeah. it's technically disadvantageous to them. Or even if they're a token deck and just have a sack outlet, they could just oh, do it at yeah. any time. Um, which would be something amazing to hold over another player's head. Like, look, you want to draw some cards and not die, or do you want to just straight up die? I'll let you draw two <laughs> cards if you're my ally this turn. Like, but you swing anything at me, I'm just going to make you die immediately. <laughs> you could, you know, you probably control it by having a sack outlet on board. Yeah. So you can always sack Kothoped. 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 Who knows? K Fed. K Fed. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no. It is K-Fed, too. That's amazing. <laughs> there's K-Fed and there's K-Mole. Yep. I like K-Fed a lot better. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of competition for the mono black commander. There's a ton of really good ones. Um, but I could see this being a deck. Yeah. I, I could see this being a deck and just forcing... Do, have a lot of board wipes. Um, maybe have a lot of edict effects as well. Um, as yep. well as just being able to destroy other people's permanents. Uh, I could see this being really fun. You don't get too many options to destroy permanents in mono black, but... It could be. I think it'd be a fun build around. Well, you have you have you have the effects that make everybody else um, sacrifice permanence every turn. You know, you've got the shieldreds and, and things like that, and so that would combo really well with K Fed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so K Fed's nice. Uh, I like I like him a lot. He's my favorite so far. That's for sure. Plus, he used to he used to be uh, married to Britney Spears for a little while, isn't that right? Yeah, and he was a sweet dancer apparently. So yeah, and he has cool hats. <laughs> All right. All right. On K-Fed. to the next one. Uh, this one is. All Hammeret, High Arbiter. He's the guy he's the, that uh, mind fought with Jace. Yeah, he's the mind fighter. Um, he's five and two blue, seven mana total for a five five flying legendary creature Sphinx. As he enters the battlefield, each opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose the name of a non land card revealed that way. Your opponents can't cast spells with the chosen name. Ugh. So. You can only mm. choose one card name. Well, and you also can only choose a card they actually reveal from their hand. Yeah. So he's sort of uh, conditionally meddling mages something. You're not going to choose their commander because that's not going to be in their hand usually. Yeah. Um, he's also seven mana to get that effect out, which is... 
And the effect's not that great. Yeah, exactly. Um, if he's going to cost seven mana, why don't they just make him like a seven seven flyer? I guess that's too good and limited. Yeah. Also, I mean, if they really, I mean, here's the thing, because this is his effect doesn't affect limited that much at all, actually. If you make it say each opponent reveals his or her hand, you choose the name of a non land card revealed this way from each player's hand, and then your opponents can't cast spells with the chosen names. That'd be sweet. You choose one card per player and be like, you can't cast that. I would play that in a heartbeat. That'd be awesome. Oh, that would be really good. And then if you could flicker them, you could sort of reset it once in a while and stuff. And that wouldn't be too powerful and limited. That's totally what they should have done. Yeah. Jimmy, why aren't you a game designer? Uh, My resume is in the mail. It's <laughs> on the way. I think as it is, uh, he's totally not playable as a commander. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I just don't even think he's playable in general. Um, just seven mana for that kind of effect is not... I mean, like you said, Meddling Mage costs, what, two mana to get out? Yeah. Yeah. So. I think he's okay and limited um, because you can play him and then blank and a removal spell in their hand. Of course, he costs seven mana, so a lot of times you're going to play him and there's not going to be any cards in anybody's hands. Yeah. I don't think he's great, but he's probably fringe playable. Yeah, agreed. All right, moving on to our final uh, legendary creature in the legendary creature cycle. We've got the white guy. His name is Hixis, Prison Warden, three and two white for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature human soldier. He has flash, so you can cast this spell anytime you can cast an instant. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to you, if Hixis Prison Warden entered the battlefield this turn, exile that creature until Hixis leaves the battlefield. Hmm. So he's sort of banisher priest something, but it has to have done damage to you. Yeah. But he does have flash. Right. So it makes people it makes it disincentivizes people from attacking you, that's for sure. Um, because if someone's like, I'm gonna swing at you with my commander, you can be like, I'm gonna flash in Hixus as soon as it deals combat damage if your commander doesn't kill me, um, and it's gonna get exiled. It's that if your commander doesn't kill me part that really gets in the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it is interesting, though, because it'll exile multiple creatures if you have multiple things swing at you and you're still alive. Um, so I can see that being a potential upside against, I don't know, just people that are just trying to run you down over time because you could potentially get like a four for one or even like a 10 for one if you have a bunch of one ones swinging oh, at you. That's interesting. Of course, the problem becomes if they ever get rid of Hixis, then they get all that stuff back. Yeah, unless they're tokens, in which case they disappear forever. Um, oh, that's a good point. The other thing is that if it is a commander, they get to just put their commander back into the command zone, so it may not necessarily oh, yeah. get exiled under Hixis. Oh, uh, yeah, good point, too. Um, I think all this is adding up to the fact that Hixis is maybe playable inside your 99 sometimes, but definitely doesn't seem like a good commander. Yeah, it seems like sort of a meta call. Like, if there's a lot of aggressive attacking decks and not so many, like, going to kill you with my enchantments, he could be really fun. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't see him being too playable in the long run. Yeah, me neither. All right, so that does it for our Legendary creature cycle. Um, not too impressed. Uh, but there are lots of sweet options. I think uh, the green, red, and black options are really, really cool. Just either in the 99. I think black is the only one I would consider building a deck around. Um, yeah. But the rest seem really exciting. So I I'm just glad that that Wizards has chosen to always give us some legendary creatures in every set, even if they're not good, quote-unquote. Yeah, and then these are definitely playable in the 99, like you said. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, we're not going to get, like, new top-tier legendary creatures every single set and we have all the planeswalkers too and a couple of those are probably playable so i think there is definitely some stuff to play with oh yeah and it's just fun for cubes and stuff too i think all of these have a lot of flavor for that yeah so. okay so we're gonna go down uh by color we'll start with green here and we're just gonna talk briefly about a few cards that stood out to us as playable uh in edh so the first one you want to start jimmy yeah woodland bellower Roar! look at this guy he's like Roar! elmer leveled up He's... Oh, man, he is Elmer on some serious HGH. <laughs> yeah. Or I guess BGH, Beast Growth Hormone. Uh, he's, El he's Elmer Bonds. <laughs> yeah, seriously. He's foreign... El Elmer Armstrong. <laughs> Elmer Armstrong. Yeah, he ate his, uh, he ate his spinach this morning. Uh, he's four and <laughs> two... Elmer Popeye. Yeah, he's 4 and 2 green for a 6-5 six, uh, six, creature beast. When Woodland Bellower enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converting mana cost 3 or less, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Uh, the first thing I like to think about is, well, he cheats stuff out, which is great. Um, we always know. We always say it. If anything cheats something into play, it's good. And this one tutors and cheats something into play. Yeah. Uh, this card is great if you just, um, because you can essentially get any card in your graveyard because you can just always search out your uh, Eternal Witness. 
Yeah, very. Oh, good point. Yeah, there's lots of good things to search out that are green and three or less. I'm sure you guys can think of more. Um, it has to be green, though. It has to be a green creature specifically. Right, but it could be green uh, and blue. Mm -hmm. It could be green uh, hybrid, so it doesn't have to be mono green. Yes, definitely. Wish this could get the profit of crew fix, but... Yeah, unfortunately, not she all dreams. costs uh, too much mana. Not all dreams can uh, come true. Not all dreams can come true. I, this card is just good. It's definitely going to see play. Yeah, I agree. Plus, it's a 6-5 for 6 mana, so it's like it tutors you something into play, and then it just sits there as a huge dude that's going to like beat their face. Yeah, I'm sure there's a Xenogod uh, oh, yeah. deck that wants him for something very specific. Can't think of it yeah. right now, though. Eternal Witness is good enough. Yeah, exactly. I mean, anytime you can grab Eternal Witness and play it for free the same turn you play another giant creature and to get something back into your hand, it's like, oh my gosh, the value. Uh, so much value. Okay. So <laughs> All right, the next card is Animist's Awakening. It's reveal the top X cards of your... Oh, sorry. It costs green and X. It's a sorcery. Reveal the top X cards of your library. Put all land cards from among them onto the battlefield tapped and the rest onto the bottom of your library in a random order. Full it up. Um, yep. You don't shuffle your library. You just put them on just the bottom the randomly. Yeah. Revealed, yeah. And then it has spell mastery. So this is a new mechanic. Uh, spell mastery is if there are two or more instants and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, then you get an additional effect. And this one has spell mastery. Untap those lands. So if you have pretty easy to do, if you have two instants, two sorceries, or one, one instant and one sorcery yeah. or more in your graveyard, then all the lands that you get with this card don't come into play tapped. They come into play untapped. Yeah, this sounds nuts. Um, this sounds insanity. Yeah, there's another card that does this, but it has three green in the casting cost. I think Animus Awakening is going to be the newer option for decks that aren't as heavily in green. Yeah. Um, not to mention this just scales so well because the later the game gets, the more you're going to be able to pay for it and get onto the battlefield. And also the, the higher chance is going to be that you can untap those lands. I mean, it will not be hard for decks to just literally put 10 mana, 10 lands onto the battlefield at some turn and mm -hmm. just like, that's going to be insanity. Imagine this with like a, let's say you just have a land heavy hand and you also have scroll rack and you're like, I'm just going to toss all these lands onto the top of my deck. Oh, it'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, even yeah. just doing this for, let's say, let's say you know you have three lands coming up, even just doing this for four mana and getting three untapped lands is pretty good. Seems great. Uh, okay, you want to read the next one? All right, we have Evolutionary Leap. One in a green. It's an enchantment. For green, you can sacrifice a creature, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card. Put that card into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Um, this card reminds me a lot of Survival of the Fittest, uh, except you are sacrificing a creature instead of discarding one from your hand. Um, I like the flavor of it, the idea that you are changing one thing into another. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, it goes into your hand. It's not sheeted onto the battlefield. Uh, the power level is there, definitely, but I don't think it's really pushed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good, you know, we're always talking about having sack outlets, mm -hmm. and this is just a good one. It's not the best one, but definitely, definitely, like, greater good is pretty expensive. You can't afford greater good, and Survival of Fittest is not a cheap card either. So I can see a situation where you can't afford those two cards. This does a decent approximation of those two things. Yeah, I can see this being really good in the token deck, too, because you can just change all of your token creatures into hopefully your higher value ones, um, no matter what. That's true. Uh, Although can... usually uh, token decks don't have a ton of creature cards, but yeah. but you, you have a few key ones, so yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to just search out something specific, or even if it's, you know, like... It's just great to potentially use this in one of those conditions where you know, like, a board wipe's coming. You know, you can recover from it much better than everyone else can if you have some green mana up. Yeah, that's a really good point. You can just at least, like, get three or four cards into your hand. Yeah. Um, okay, the next one is Gaia's Revenge. It's five and two green for a creature elemental. It's an eight, five. Oof. It's, it, it can't be countered. It has haste. It says Gaia's Revenge can't be the target of non-green spells or abilities from non-green sources. Hmm. That's an interesting... So you can't even target it with non-green spells or abilities. Oh, right. It's got very conditional shroud. Yeah, it's like shroud except for green. Interesting. Uh, um, I was just thinking Xenagos. Definitely a Xenagos card. Yeah. Um, and it has haste, too, so you don't even need Xenagos out to just put the beatdowns on. So it could yeah. be a nice late game finisher in case someone does manage to get rid of your commander, which <laughs> never happens in that deck. Yeah, that's true. Never happened. But, and also, can't be countered is definitely relevant. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I like it. I, th- I think it's just a good beater if you need it. Yep, not a ton else to say about it. Yeah. Um, moving on, we have another revenge. It's Nissa's revenge. Lots of people getting revenge in Origins, apparently. Oh, it's Nissa's revelation. Oh, I you're that right. that down wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, well, Nissa's That's having a revelation. Um, she's having a revenge revelation. Uh, yeah, because what she's pulling out in her revelation is pretty uh, scary. If you look at the card art, I believe that is one of the Eldrazi. I believe that is the Big Daddy himself, Emrakul. What is Nissa doing like letting the Eldrazi out. That seems whatever. I haven't read all the all the. All I know the she's directly line, so. connected to it, and I think um, Animus Awakening is how she gets her uh, Planeswalker Spark. But all of these cards, by the way, if you guys are super into Vorthos, there's a cycle in every color for every Planeswalker that uh, details their story. So Nissa's Pilgrimage, her Revelation, and Animus Awakening are all in- inherently tied to her uh, her origin story. All right, you want to read it? Yeah, it's five and two green for a sorcery. Scry five, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, you draw cards equal to its power and you gain life equal to its toughness. Ooh, so scrying, if you guys don't know, you look at the top X cards of your library. You can put any of them on the bottom of your library and then back onto the top of your library in any order. So when you scry five here, you're definitely going to, you're most likely going to find a creature. Uh, and then you reveal the top card and you get to draw cards equal to its power and gain life equal to its toughness. The draw cards bit is the most uh, interesting to me for sure. Yeah, and you can set this up too with anything that fixes the top of your deck, like like Sensei's Divining Top mm-hmm. or Scroll Rack or all kinds of stuff. And this is a type of effect green has trouble uh, doing on its own normally. Yeah. Yeah, you could definitely use the top to just check before the beginning of your turn like hey should i use this as revelation this turn you look and you see you know guys revenge up top you're like i would like to draw eight cards this turn that sounds great <laughs> yeah and gain five life just because yeah and, that's and a- you're scrying five so you know at least a lot of those cards are going to be you know good because you can at least put a bunch of lands on the bottom yeah exactly and that's nice that's really really nice even if you scry all of them to the bottom and just need a new chance at the whatever the card is up top i don't know i feel like this is a really strong card um scrying five sounds really great late game yeah, I generally don't like one-time usage card draw spells, but this one is very powerful, so I could see it being useful. And again, in mono green, you just don't have a lot of options to draw a bunch of cards, uh, and this is a pretty good one. Mm, I like it a lot. Okay, the next one is Outland Colossus. It's three and two green for a 6-6. Six, six. So five mana 6-6, six, six, that seems pretty good. Yep. It has Renown 6. So Renown is a new mechanic. It says, when this creature deals combat damage to a player... If it isn't renowned, you put that many 1-1 one, one counters on it, and then it becomes renowned. So if it's renowned 6, and it does combat damage to a player, it will get 6 plus 1 plus 1 counters. So if this guy hits a player, he becomes a 12-12. <laughs> it also says Outland Colossus can't be blocked by more than one creature. So you you can never double, triple, quadruple block this thing. Yeah, good luck. Uh, yeah. At, when it's a 12-12, you need, like, uh, you need... A giant thing to stop it. You need, yeah. You need um, Eldrazi. <laughs> you do. This guy in Xenagos, again, seems like you get yeah. him out with haste on turn five, um, and then he hits somebody for 12, and then the next turn he's going to hit him for 24. Yeah, that's pretty insane. Um, if Renown could stack more than once, and they don't become Renown, and they just get to put more counters on him, that would be insane. But this becoming a 12-12, um, geez. I mean, for for one thing, if it is in the Xenagos deck, he's trampling over, so he's definitely doing combat damage. Um, all the Renown cards are great with Trample. Uh, well, Xenagos doesn't give Trample, so you'd have to have something oh, right. else to give him Trample. But right. Xenagos, usually I'd say on turn five, if you're in a large game, there'll be somebody without anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in a five or six player game or a four player game even, uh, there's a good chance that even just playing him and attacking on turn six, you can hit at least somebody. And a five mana six six, nothing to sneeze at. And if it's, if you're on turn like six or seven and it's a twelve twelve, that's a real threat. Yeah, seriously. Oh gosh, that that is that's intense. I like it. All well, right. This next one might be my favorite card. Yeah, and it's an uncommon, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know how playable it is in limited, but it's definitely a good EDH card. It's Elemental Bond. Um, it's an enchantment for two and a green. Whenever a creature with power three or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Easy as that. Oh, it's so good in Titania. Oh, it's so good in Titania. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's amazingly good in Titania. Um, every Titania deck will run this. A lot of just green decks will run it. I mean, like we said, Xenagos, it's really good because anytime you play one of your creatures, you just get to draw a card. Yeah. 
Uh, it's a very, very, very strong card. Just green in general. That's two card draw spells. That green in, has never had before. In this set. And then also the uh, Evolutionary Leap is sort of a card draw spell with a sacrifice uh, effect tacked on. So that's mm-hmm. a lot of card draw for green. And what are we always saying decks need? Card draw and mana ramp. Well, what does green do really well? Mana ramp. Yeah. So if it can also draw cards, like, boy, it's getting really strong. Yeah, that that's a lot of fun. That card's good. The card's just straight up good. It requires very little for it to be good in EDH because a lot of your creatures are just going to be bigger than three power. Yeah, and there's other cards that do this effect but do it for everybody. This mm-hmm. one is only creatures you control. So all of a sudden, there's just very little downside. Uh, you know, you wouldn't play it, obviously, if your deck doesn't have a lot of three uh, power creatures, but most decks do, so... Good card. Um, one more green card we thought we'd talk about. It's Zendikar's Royal. That's R-O-I-L. Not a not a, like a king or a queen royal. <laughs> That's three and two green for an enchantment. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a 2-2 green elemental creature token onto the battlefield. So another Titania card. Yeah, this is all about Titania. I mean, this is all about... I mean, you could put this in a uh, Azusa deck as well, yep. just because yep. you're going to have a lot of lands going into the battlefield. Anything Um, that plays like Exploration and Burgeoning probably wants a card like this just because you're planning to cheat a lot of lands out uh, and you're just getting value every time you you put a land into play. It seems seems playable in a lot of decks. Yeah, I like it a lot. Um, It it just matches what green generally does in EDH, so it's going to be a good addition if you are looking for card draw and it's 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 something that your deck does a lot. The interesting thing we'll see to be, or will be to see if it's playable in just token decks, mm-hmm. like because if you have parallel lives out and doubling season, you're playing a land and getting like three two twos. Like that oh seems pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wonder if it'll see play in those decks. It seems like it might. Yep, I think it will. Um, I, that combination right there sounds great to me. So I'm I'm down. <laughs> it's just a question of how often you're going to have that full thing set up. It feels like once you get doubling season out, you better win pretty quick. Otherwise, everyone's just going to kill you. Yeah, exactly. Um... Next up, we're going to move into red, my favorite color, and also kind of the least powerful color in this set for uh, EDH, unfortunately. Um, let's start off with one of the early cards that was spoiled for Origins, which Avaricious Dragon, 2-2 two two red for a 4-4 four, four creature dragon that has flying. At the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card. At the beginning of your end step, discard your hand. So I can see this having a really good limited standard constructed play because, you know, it's a card that draws you extra cards in red. Um, and hopefully, you know, if you're a beat down deck, you're going to not, you're going to be totally fine with discarding your hand because you're going to have played out everything from it at that point anyway, by the time you get to four mana. Right. Um, uh, I can see this having a more limited use in EDH. I could see it being good late game. You're never going to play this on turn four, I don't think. Um, but there, I think they're really risky, really risky. I think they're just better way because also like if you're going to be playing a mono red deck or a deck with this ability because you need the card draw, there's a good chance that you're going to have another card that's just going to draw you more cards in general, and you're not going to be able to play all of them out of your hand before Avaricious Dragon makes you uh, toss all of them. So, Yeah, I think the only way... Maybe there's some combos we're not thinking of. Maybe there's uh, some listeners that have some cool ideas about uh, abusing the discard angle as like an upside rather than a downside. Now, mm-hmm. we know there are decks like uh, Alicia, Alesha, that want cards in their graveyard. I still don't think this card's probably very good in that deck, though, because you still want some cards in your hand. And it's yeah. too easy for somebody to just kill this dragon, and it's like all of a sudden you didn't get your extra card, and you discarded you know, six yeah, cards. Yeah, exactly. If someone kills you before your next upkeep, you have a lot of... Or before your next draw step, then you're, you'll have discarded your hand, because when you play this card, you're going to discard your hand immediately at the end yeah. of your turn, so... Yeah. Uh, I yeah. We we wanted to bring it up because it is a mythic, but it seems very risky. Yeah, super risky. Um, okay, the next one is called Chandra's Ignition. It's three and two red for a sorcery. It says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature and each opponent. Ooh. That's kind of cool. Is, yeah, this thing can... So somebody blows big. They warp, they wipe the board, and then they also do their power in damage to each opponent, but not you. Yeah, that's actually really cool. Um, yeah, I can see this in again in Xenagos, where you make something really huge because Xenagos doubles their power, mm-hmm. and then you just... 
it goes supernova and takes everybody out. Yeah, the nice thing about cards like this is that in a deck like Xenagos, where you're usually just focusing on one person to die, it's hard to get everyone out at once. And so being able to Chandra's Ignition after your second, uh, after your combat step, when you have like a 24-24 out, you might just be able to kill everyone. Yeah, it's a and really you, good point. Usually for red too, this effect affects you um, on top, but this is each other creature, so it does affect your creatures, but it's each opponent. So you're going to be using this mostly as a one-hit kill spell to kill everyone, I think. I think so. You could combine this with like Arc Bond and basically... Holy crap. And basically, the, you know, all you'd need, I think, at that point is a creature with like about, you know, 15 to 20 power. Mm -hmm. And then if you cast Chandra's Ignition and then Arc Bond something else, then all of a sudden everything's taking twice as much or all your opponents are taking, you know, what was that, 30 damage? Yeah. Like, you could easily take out everybody with those two cards. Yeah, that's pretty intense. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the next one. Flame Shadow Conjuring. Three and a red for an enchantment. Uh, whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay red. If you do, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that creature. That token gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. This is my favorite card uh, out of red. Um, yeah, this I is... love replicating creatures for Enter the Battlefield shenanigans. Yeah, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I mean, there's so many ETB effect type decks out there. Obviously, you can't go in something like Rune, but it can go in a whole bunch of decks that are just basically getting value from Enter the Battlefield effects. And this is one mana to basically double up your Enter the Battlefield effect. Yeah. Not um, to mention just being able to attack with that creature still. Yeah, I think this is better than Splinter Twin, you know, in a lot of ways, because you're, if, if you're not going infinite with Splinter Twin, because when a creature... I mean, this you can do this on the same turn you play a creature. Splinter Twin usually takes a... a you know, and you have to tap that creature to use it. Right, um, and, you know, that creature is uh, susceptible to removal, where it's a lot harder to remove just an enchantment by itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of decks that aren't going infinite, this, is, this could play better than Splinter Twin, or at least get more incremental value over the course of a game, whereas Splinter Twin sort of just like, you play it, and then you either win or somebody kills that creature. Yeah, and it's tied to the creature. Flame Shadow Conjuring is just there. I mean, this seems great. You can play it. I, I'm really all about the fact that Splinter Twin, again, can only copy one thing. Kiki Jiki mm -hmm. can only do uh, non-legendary creatures. Mm -hmm. You can do some crazy things with this card. I think this is going to be a silent all-star of the uh, the set. It really makes me want to turn my um, my rune deck, my flicker, flicker deck, into a five-color five color. deck. <laughs> just this card by itself makes me want to do that. At a certain point, we're going to ask Josh what deck he's playing, and he's just going to pull out the same commander, and then just it's just, you have every no time. idea who, what deck it's going to be. Yeah, because <laughs> I'll all actually five color. just have seven decks, but only the one commander card. Yeah. Just, that'll always be in my command zone. I'll just change the deck. That oh my gosh, people would <laughs> never know what to play against you. It'd be great. They would just be like, "Oh, the red sleeves. I know what's coming." No, you don't. Yeah, but for the next leveling, then you definitely just change the sleeves out at one point. No, <laughs> no too, I'm way you're too lazy. Too lazy. Yeah, you yeah. Know I don't even. That. Yeah, you know me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the last red card. There's there wasn't many red cards because uh, red is so focused on like damage dealing and things like yeah. that. It doesn't there are a lot well. of artifact matters cards though. So if you are looking to potentially buff up your artifacts deck, I would just take a look and see if there's anything that uh, interests you. Yeah, that's true. There's probably some cards that are playable in EDH. They're just not anything sort of new or exciting. Yep. Um, the next one is Thopter Engineer. So it's two and a red for a one, three creature human artificer. When Thopter Engineer enters the battlefield, put a one, one colorless, Thopter artifact creature token with flying onto the battlefield. And then it also says artifact creatures you control have haste. That's sweet. Yep. And this would be a good thing to copy with the uh, flame shadow conjuring because you just get one extra Thopter for mm -hmm. one for one mana. Um, it's just giving all your artifact creatures haste is very powerful. And it does work in conjunction with, you know, in a small way with flicker effects and that type of thing. I think it's playable. It's not awesome. But if you're in a budget realm, this is usable in your um, Duretti decks and such. Yeah, I like it a lot, too. Also, a lot of artifact creatures are mana rocks. Um, so oh, good point. giving them haste means you can also tap them as soon as you play them. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right. Oh, that does it for red. Uh, let's move on to black. Dun, 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 dun. And one card that is really interesting. Uh, Demonic Pact. Liliana's getting crazy over here. 
the flavor on this card is out of control, by the way. All right, so mm -hmm, the converted mm -hmm. mana cost is four, two and two black. It's an enchantment. It says, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose one that hasn't been chosen, and there are four options. The first option, Demonic Pact deals four damage to target creature or player, and you gain four life. Again, the four theme. Target opponent discards two cards. Or you can do draw two cards, or the fourth option, which you do not want to do until the last choice, you lose the game. You don't want to do that one ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to get rid of this card before that happens, hopefully. <laughs> um, first of all, the flavor is awesome. We talked about the story uh, in our w when we reviewed the Planeswalkers. Um, Liliana, had, she went to Nicol Bolas, and then he put her in contact with like four different demons, and she had to make four different deals with them. So these are her well, deals. Part of with the, the game devil. has her losing the game, though. <laughs> what Barbara's story? I mean, I think that's when she confronts like the most powerful of the demons, and she has to make the deal. But that demon's right. going to kill her if she doesn't come if she doesn't keep her end of the bargain. So that's the sort of the risk that she's taking. This yeah, this card's pretty crazy. Yeah, so you you choose. You know, deal four damage, gain four life. You choose somebody discards two cards. Then you choose draw two cards. And then at that point, you've already chosen each of the other options once. So you have to choose lose the game on your next upkeep. Now, yeah, this begs the question, what do you do with this thing? You can do a couple of things. One is you can flicker it. Yep. So if you flicker it out and it comes back, then it resets it because it's it's a new card, basically. And you can choose all the options you've already chosen because you flickered it out. The other thing you can do is choose all th the first three options and then you can use a card that gifts it to somebody else. So you can use one of these cards that says, oh, give one of your permanents to another player. Oh, my gosh. That's actually really funny. Yeah. And in that case, the card is the same card. So it's the other three things have already been chosen. So that player has to choose. You lose the game. So on the third turn, you have this. You've chosen the three. You gift it to your, the player to your left or whatever. And on their upkeep, they immediately they lose the game if they yeah, can't. Get if they can't get rid of it. it. So this is really magical Christmas land. But man, I really want people to try and do it because I want to hear yeah. stories. I want to hear stories. Yeah, you combine this with extra turn effects so you can get rid of it faster. Oh my yeah. gosh. Um, yeah, demonic pact. Uh, it's an interesting card. Um, I don't see myself playing it too often, but. No, you it's super manage. risky. It's super yeah. risky. Oh, it's and, incredibly risky. And you'd have to, I mean, you'd have to already have a deck that's gifting it stuff, which there are those decks, uh, in which case it's probably fine. Otherwise, I think, eh, I don't know, a flicker deck might be okay if you have a flicker target permanent type effects. It might be mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, draw two cards, if you can do that basically every turn because you're flickering it, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. That's, that's really nice. Um, just an extra two cards with no downside to usually you have to pay a life in black, so... Yeah, um, but, I really, I really like the game design. On, the design on that card is very good. Yeah, it, it, oh man, I wish this card will, will get played in standard. I think that'd be so sweet. Maybe it will. It's better, you know, maybe somebody's Travis Wu will try it. Yes, he definitely will. So please, Travis, please, please. Um, next up is maybe Black's strongest card. Uh, it's Dark Petition. It's got Grizzlebrand just murdering some fools or something. I don't know. It's really dark. Um, three and two black for a sorcery. Search your library for a card and put that card into your hand, then shuffle your library. So it is Demonic Tutor, but it costs five instead of two and has two black instead of one black. However, it also has Spell Mastery. If there are two more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, add black, black, black to your mana pool. So this card could potentially uh, cost two, if that makes sense, if you're able to use that mana. Yeah, I think people are a little bit overrating it. Don't get me wrong, it's still very good. Um, one of the good things about Demonic Tutor is you can play it on turn two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. This you can't play until you actually have five mana, and then it'll give you a refund, which is great. Um, it makes it definitely better than something like Diabolic Tutor. I think it's still not as good as the Vampiric Tutors and the Grim oh, Tutors and such not. of the world. But It'd be a great budget option, however. Yeah, I think it's totally playable. It's very, very good. Um and then on those turns, those later turns where you're tutoring for something that'll give you the chance to actually play that card that you got, that's very powerful. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that one kind of speaks for itself. This next card is interesting. It's called Infinite Obliteration. It's one and two black for a sorcery. It says, name a creature card. Search target opponent's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. Then that player shuffles his or her library. So this is not generally the card we want to play because you're only going to get one card. Mm -hmm. However, I can see certain metas where this type of card, and there are other cards that do this. This isn't the only one. It's just that 
if you're newer or you're more budget or whatever and you get a hold of this card, you know, if you know you've got a, a play group where a guy always goes and gets, you know, Triskelion and Micaeus, then you right. can go get rid of one of those. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I actually like that aspect of it quite a bit in that case. Um because this does stop an opponent's infinite combo, and it doesn't matter where the card is in their yep. graveyard, hand, or library. So uh, you're definitely getting the card no matter what. Um, that's why it's kind of cool. It's the infinite obliteration. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Josh is right here. You, you usually don't do this in EDH because you can only get one card, so it's a one-for-one one at the very least. But it does stop those infinite combos. Um, this would be yeah, really interesting. it's not even really what we'd call a one-for-one because one it's not getting rid of something on the board. Right. So it's like you're using a card out of your hand, and you're getting something potentially not even in their hand. So it's... Well, this does hose one of your decks, Josh. Uh, Marchesa? No. I mean, Travel Valora? Which no. deck? Uh, the one that plays a billion of one card. Oh, yeah. It totally hoses the Shadowborn <laughs> Apostles deck. That's true. You just... <laughs> just lit that yeah. thing on fire, man. Holy That's crap. That's true. Uh, I, I changed my mind. Don't play that card. <laughs> um, yeah, never play it. Never play it. Never look the at next it. one people are comparing to Damnation. Yeah, interestingly enough, it is not Damnation, but no. it's the closest Black has gotten since Damnation, I think, uh, outside of, of course, the cards that we talked about that are our favorite board wipes in Black. Uh, Languish, two and two Black, Sorcery, all creatures get minus four, minus four until end of turn. Um, very powerful. Mm -hmm. However, not Damnation, but still pretty good. Yeah, it's decent. It, it will very often not kill the stuff that you really want it to kill so mm -hmm. i don't know it depends on your meta again if it's playable but also you could build your deck so that you know you've got all the big creatures so it, it's a one-sided board wipe oh yeah that's a good point yeah i mean I, I can see this being played i would play this in the deck if i needed more board wipe abilities and it was mono black i could definitely see this making it in there because even though it is a little conditional it's still going to get rid of a lot of stuff um, yeah, it's true. And especially if your deck is the type that's like weak to token decks. Or, yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. Or there's a lot of utility creatures in your meta, that kind of thing. Uh, the next one is Priest of the Blood Rite. It's uh, three and two black for a creature human cleric. It's a two two. It says, when Priest of the Blood Rite enters the battlefield, put a five five black demon creature token with flying onto the battlefield. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose two life. So this thing is crazy with flicker effects. Yeah. Oh my and, gosh. And Three just five fives. Yep. And just reusing it, you know, over and over, recasting it or or whatever. You're just getting free five fives all the time is is insane. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of Priest of the Blood Rite, especially in Limited. Oh my gosh, this card oh, comes this is down. A house in Limited. Yeah. You don't care about that two life because you're hitting them for five in the air and you're going to win well, that race. Plus, you just block with the Priest of the Blood Rite as soon as you can and get yeah. rid of it because the token's not what's making you lose the life. Mm -hmm. And there are a few cards in the set that also let you sacrifice. Um, so you can definitely get rid of it in a few other ways. Uh, yeah, I like this card. Um, I don't. It doesn't have a huge impact. There are a lot of black abilities in, on cards that let you pump out 4-4 uh, four, four black demons, 5-5 five, five black demons or whatever. Yeah. This is a nice way if you are uh, able to abuse it with Flicker, though, for sure. Yeah, I think it's it's... It's not going to be the most powerful de card in your deck ever, yeah. um, but it is fringe playable. Yeah, definitely. Um, next card is Graveblade Marauder, two in the black for a 1-4 human warrior with death touch. Whenever Graveblade Marauder deals combat damage to a player, that player loses life equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Um, so yeah, these abilities usually are pretty strong if you can build around it or just make sure that you know, if you have like a dredge deck or if your deck is like Tassiger and you're just going to have a lot of creature cards in your graveyard in general, um, the death touch makes it very relevant. It's hard to block. Um, and I'm trying to think, there's probably some kind of cool combo you can do where you swing in with someone and you only have a couple creatures in your graveyard. Someone's like, I'm not going to block. And then you find a way to dump a ton in there. I think that'd be really sweet. Yeah. I also think just like Alesha which mm -hmm. we talked about a few episodes ago, this card is very good in that deck because you're just dumping creatures in there anyway. Yeah. And then you can just keep bringing this back if they do block because the Death Touch will trade with something and then you, you know, trigger her ability and do it again. Yep, yep. I can definitely yeah. see that happening. I like that. Yep. Um, the next one is Shadows of the Past. It's one and a black for an enchantment. It says, whenever a creature dies, scry one. That's pretty good. 
And then you can pay four in a black, and each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. Activate this ability only if there are four or more creature cards in your graveyard. So it's sort of like a Siphon Soul, but you only gain two life total. You don't gain, uh, you know, if there are 10 players, you don't gain 20 life or whatever. Yeah, that would be super busted. Yeah. Um, it's still pretty dang good because it's cheap. It's just scry one on any creature dying, not just yours. So yeah, that is amazing. The scry one they say is worth somewhere around half a card. So that's pretty great if you're getting half a card every time any creature dies. Yeah. And then later in the game, if you just have mana available, you can just start pinging everybody for two, and you gain two, which is negligible. But hitting all players for two is it's something. Yeah, a, called, a card called Perforos does this. Yes. That's pretty powerful. Although you can literally kill everyone in one turn by dropping 20 tokens onto the battlefield, yeah, which yeah. you'd need 50 mana to do that. But yeah, it is very... I just think this card adds up. It's like a bunch of small effects that add up to a lot of value. Yeah, exactly. And late game, this could be really relevant. People are usually at low life totals, and you can threaten to kill someone with Shadows of the Past. Um, scrying one is awesome because it just helps smooth out your draws. Creatures are going to die en masse in the commander game in general, so... I like this card a lot. Yeah, I really like it. All right, next up, and the last card we have in black here is Dark Dabbling. Uh, again, it's Liliana about to dabble in some darkness. Hey, what did you say? Uh, dabbling in the dark arts? Never good. Never good, yeah. Don't dabble in the dark it doesn't arts. doesn't end well. It doesn't actually start well either. Yeah, well, I mean, if you are in, you know, I'm trying to think of a Harry Potter reference here, but whatever. Gryffindor for life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dark good Dabbling one, is, one. yeah, it's a good, it's, this is an interesting card too, actually. I like this one a lot. Uh, two and a black for an instant. Regenerate target creature, draw a card. So at its base, it is a cantrip, which means it will draw you a card, uh, re thus replacing itself. Uh, also, regenerating a creature can be very helpful in Magic the Gathering and EDH because, you know, usually creatures need to die in the game and you want to save them. Mm -hmm. uh, spell Mastery, if there are two or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, also regenerate each other creature you control. So that's really relevant. That yeah. stops most board wipes in their tracks. That's sort of one of the modes of Golgari Charm, which is mm -hmm. very good. We also, you know, EDH players will play cards like Faith's Reward or other things that sort of like counter board wipes. Yeah. So that's very strong, especially if you're doing like, let's say you're doing zombie tokens or something, uh, then you don't want, you know, it won't stop Wrath of God because it says creatures can't be regenerated, but it will stop Supreme Verdict. Mm-hmm. That will stop a lot of board wipes, um, which is good. And in general, I think by the time a board wipe hits, you should be able to trigger Spell Mastery. Um, I'd be interested to see how often Spell Mastery doesn't trigger. Uh, I think your deck needs to at least kind of be ready to abuse it a little bit because um, some decks are just so creature heavy that you're just not going to get many of those in the graveyard. So Yeah, it's a good point. But it is the type of effect that early in the game you don't actually need the effect because yeah. you won't have a lot of creatures out yet. And so late in the game, you're more likely to have more instants and sorceries in the graveyard, and that's coincidentally the time when you'll probably want to cast something like this. Yeah, and early in the game, if you do need to bust it out, it's great because guess what? You only need to save one creature or whatever in general if someone's just trying to get rid of it. Like, say if you get your commander out early or whatever. Yeah, or you can just cycle it. You can just grab it, pay three mana, draw a card, and regenerate something that didn't even mm -hmm. isn't going to die just to just to move on. I mean, that's not the best use of it, but the worst-case scenario is not that bad. Yeah, yeah, I think this card's playable in some decks. Yeah, you can also use it uh, to help out an opponent regenerate their creature, right? Yeah, good point. Yep. Yeah. I don't see that being used very often, and I think it's actually really powerful in this game because it it's really risky because someone could just be like, uh, thanks, I don't care what you did. But it could also <laughs> buy you a lot, of, uh, a lot of goodwill down the road. Yeah, that's a good point. Um... Move okay, on to blue. let's move on to blue. Your favorite color. My favorite color. There are some good cards in this yeah, set. Yeah, there are. Uh, blue maybe. Blue maybe my favorite. Uh, I don't know. Green had a lot of good stuff too. Um, Big surprise, Josh. Yeah. Well, Green had a lot of stuff for Titania specifically, which is always yeah. terrifying for me. And just a lot of card draw in Green, which I felt was like very, very helpful to Green as a color. Yeah, so absolutely. It, it might have some staple cards actually. Yeah. Um, blue. Uh, the first one is Disciple of the Ring. Sounds like a Lord of the Rings reference. <laughs> it's uh, three and two blue for a human wizard, a three, four. Okay, it's got a bunch of abilities. 
Uh, pay one, exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, and then you can choose one of these. Counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays two. Or, Disciple of Rings gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Or, tap target creature. Or, untap target creature. Now remember, to activate any of, of these modes, you need to pay one mana and exile an instant or sorcery from your graveyard. Interesting. This is just the type of card that, like, it does so many things. As long as you have instants and sorceries in your deck, like a Tauran deck, then you're always going to be able to get some value out of this stuff. And the, just the countering non-creature spell is pretty good. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, sort of like the surprise mana leak effect. Um, yeah, uh, not so much surprise. It's on board, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes people just forget, yep. uh, which is great, uh, because it's a big game. Um, you can also do a lot of these per turn. Uh, I think the tapping target creature is really relevant, being able to just Maze of Ith kind of one of our creatures and yep, be like, hey, yep. you can't kill me right now. Please stop. Yep. Uh, is really important. Um, yeah, it's a good card. I think it's a little it's a little held back in power level because it's one, you have to exile an instant sorcery card from your graveyard. So at, at a certain point, you're going to run out. Right. And the abilities, none of them are really game breaking or that significant, I think. It's just sort of incremental value across the board, which but is just, good. Just think if you played Disciple of the Ring and before it died, you got to use it four times. Pretty great. Yeah, that is I pretty mean, you great. don't usually play Glen or Lendra and use her four times. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So. Um, also, the fact that you can counter a, a spell unless his controller pays two means a lot of spells actually get turned off because if the opponent doesn't have that extra two mana floating around to add to the you know to your yeah. spell, then they're kind of boned. Plus, you can do it twice. So if you have two instants or sorceries in your graveyard, you can just remove two and make them pay four. Yeah, yeah, that's so nice. You can, and then if you even just have the um, threat of doing that, they won't even try it, so they won't make you use it. So then you'll just have that threat of activation against everybody. Yeah, it's, that that effect is very powerful. I I really love threat of activation. Yeah. Um, next up, we have a card that's made a big splash uh, online. A lot of people are talking about it. Days Undoing, two in the blue for a sorcery. Each player shuffles his or her hand and draw and graveyard into his or her library, then draws seven cards. If it's your turn, end the turn. So Whoa. end the turn actually exiles anything that's on the stack and mm -hmm. any other effects that would happen, and you go straight to discard down to your maximum hand size. Um, this card is very similar to Time Twister. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what people are comparing it to. That's a good card to be compared to. Yeah, it's... Uh... And the turn thing? Well, if you can put it in a deck that has a Vidalcan Orrery or Teferi or... What is it? Yeah. Ley Leyline of Anticipation. Leyline. Um, I think Anticipation's a blue one, right? Anyway, mm -hmm. the Leyline that lets you cast everything with Flash. Uh, then you can suddenly cast this on someone else's turn, and then it becomes... You know, shuffle your hand. Everybody shuffles their hand and graveyard into the library, draw seven, and you countered something basically, or maybe yeah. a couple somethings. Uh, or you can, and even uh, abilities that are on the stack would get countered basically. Quote, well, if quote, it's countered. your turn, then you end the turn though. It doesn't end in on, on Oh, it doesn't end turn. somebody else's turn. Oh. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, like, blue doesn't get this ability very often. It's definitely like a red ability. Uh, so it's pretty impressive, I think. Yeah. Oh. The, if it's your turn and the turn. Oh, yeah, you're right. I yeah. totally read that wrong. So you can't do the cool stuff I thought. It's still cool to play on other people's turn because it doesn't end anybody's turn. Yeah. Um, because the downside is that you play it on your turn and then you can't actually use any of the cards you drew because your turn's <laughs> over. So That's right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I don't think it's quite as cool as it was, but it's still cool. It's still great in Nekusar decks and such. Yeah, exactly. And it's just a card that doesn't get seen much in blue. The sort of shuffle everything into your library and draw seven cards. You know, the Wheel of Fortune effect. Yeah, they have yeah. a few. But yeah, red sort of has been given that in recent magic. And so, yeah. But, but yeah, blue still has some that do that type of thing. Anyway, if you want that effect, you normally want it a few times over. It also yeah. stops you from getting decked. I mean, there's some good stuff. Yep, I like it. Okay, the next one has a ton of text on it. Good it's luck, Josh. Here we go. <laughs> You're gonna need the talent of the telepath to read it. <laughs> and that coincidentally is the name of the card. Wow, how'd you, you look know at that? that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, talent of the telepath is two and two blue for a sorcery. 
It says, okay, here we go. Deep breath. It doesn't say, here we go. <laughs> Target opponent reveals the top seven cards of his or her library. You may cast an instant or sorcery card from among those cards revealed without paying the mana cost. That player puts the rest into his or her graveyard. So cool. you look at their top seven cards, you cast something for free, an instant or sorcery spell, and then they put the rest in their graveyard. Then, if it has spell mastery, so if there are two or more instants and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, you may cast up to two revealed instant and or sorcery cards instead of one. Wow. This, the the ceiling of how powerful this can be is as high as it goes. Through the roof, yeah. Um, because let's say you're playing against, oh, I don't know, a hell of a deck. Yeah. Or... Uh, Kaleva or Narset. Narset, yeah. You might just get four extra turns. You <laughs> might you might get to play, you know, something, insa- uh, something insane. Like, uh, two insane things. Like, this yeah. is the type of card that you're like... Please, please use your scroll rack. Yes, please use please. your whatever. Like, you know, it's just, yeah. It's like, give me insurrection, please. Yep. Now, the floor on this card is nothing happens. So <laughs> you also have to be a little careful. But the types of deck that you would play this against, you know, I think if you just reveal a random seven cards off the top, chances are you're going to get something pretty good. And this only yeah. costs four mana. So you're cheating. Yep. You're cheating mana costs. Yeah, I could see this actually having an impact across a couple of formats because there are a lot of instants and sorceries that are just important. Like if Blue's like, I'm going to steal a lightning bolt, I need it. <laughs> yeah, true. And just um, bolt you in the face to win this game. Yeah, also it's really relevant that you put the rest of them into your graveyard. So if it is like a deck that wants to cheat them out like uh, Haleva, Jaleva, or Narset, then they have to do a lot of work to get them back on top of their library. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's yeah. too bad you can't do it to yourself, but then it would be totally broken. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I think Wizards figured that one out pretty early. There might but... be some cards. There are a few cards that make everybody play with like the top card of their library revealed, mm-hmm. or that allow you to control the um, top of your opponent's library a little bit. Or if they're playing Oracle of Moldiah or something like that, like there are yeah. ways to sort of guarantee it. It's just it's harder. It's probably a long way to go for one card, but like I said, this card it, the the ceiling is as high as it gets. Yeah, I like it. Um, next up, we got Displacement Wave. X and blue, blue. It's a sorcery. Return all non-land permanents with converted mana cost X or less to their owner's hands. Pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. Again, this card just reads to me, you choose what X is and you make the most of it. Um, it's good to have an effect that just does this in general. For blue, blue, you also get rid of every single token on the board. Mm-hmm. Um, but it can be a little weaker than it appears, I think. Just because, let's say someone has Avacyn out. You're really going to pay that much man to get Avacyn off the board. But it might be worth it, even if Avacyn is still out there, just to get rid of the rest of their stuff. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, this card's good. I, I think blue, it's kind of similar to Cyclonic Rift. It's all non-land permanents, by the way, so you're getting a lot of stuff. Enchantments. Um, it's a great way to also just hose someone's hand, because let's say someone just has a ton of stuff out but doesn't have mana rocks or whatever in their hand. Like, great, you're going to get 10 cards in your hand, you maybe only be able to play like one or two of those or whatever, and guess what? You're gonna have to discard a lot of them. Yeah, I think the the main thing more that, than ten cards, but yeah, yeah. I think the main thing that puts out cyclonic rift territory is that it hits your stuff too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's still very strong. It's just the type of effect that totally resets the board, uh, and because it's all non-land permanents, it can do things that other cards don't do. Mm-hmm. It's like get rid of enchantments and artifacts at least for now. Um, I think it's powerful. Not every deck deck wants it. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, next is Jace's Sanctum. It's in <sighs> this the, card's good. Yes, it's three and a blue for an enchantment. It says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Oh boy, so ma- basically mana ramp in blue now, huh? Great. Mm-hmm. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, scry one. Uh, that's worth half a card. Oh, this card is so good. Yeah, this card. I do real not want to play against uh, Craig's Talran deck after this set comes out. Oh my gosh! It's I mean, this card is good in so many decks. Yep, because it's not blue instants or sorceries cost one less. It's just instants and sorceries, and you get a scry one every single time. Holy moly! Yeah. Yep, it's Melek decks, uh, yeah. stuff like that. Oh man, it's very good. Yeah, just it's also a... good in my Chai Yun Fat deck. <laughs> yep, my, uh, very good. Very good in that deck. deck. Yeah. yeah. Just because he also triggers prowess and stuff. So 
It's a good, uh, good card. You mean Shu Yun, everybody, by the way. Shu Yun, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just call him Chow Yun Fat now. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I knew who you meant. Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, moving on, we got Thopter Spy Network. <laughs> I think this actually might be my favorite blue card. This is awesome. great. Another awesome card. Thopter Spy Network? What kind of card name is that? You never see that. <laughs> uh, it's two and two blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control an artifact, put a one one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying onto the battlefield. So it's Bitter Blossom without yeah. the downside. <laughs> yeah, and you just have to have an artifact. Just put a Dark Steel Citadel out there. Have fun. But it's Bitter, uh, Bottom, Bitter Blossom plus another ability. Yeah, whenever one or more artifact creatures you control deals da combat damage to a player, draw a card. Draw a card. That means any of your artifact creatures, not just the Thopters that you made. Yeah. Unfortunately, that. I guess fortunately, too, because that would be busted. It's not for every creature you play right. that, that does damage that when it attacks. But, I mean, here's the thing. It's putting on a 1-1 one, one flyer. That card is going to be able to hit someone. So you can essentially have this read... At the beginning of your upkeep, put a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying on the battlefield. On your damage step, draw a card. I mean, really. It's basically draw an extra card. It's Bitter Blossom plus. I mean, Bitter Blossom is already pretty awesome. Yeah, and it only costs two extra mana, and that's totally worth it for the effect, I think. Yeah, and you're only putting it in decks with a lot of artifacts, so... Yeah, even if you only have, like, a decent amount, like, you're probably going to be able to use this still. I mean, like, even just a Soul Ring or a Guild of Lotus. But yeah, in general, you want this in an artifact-heavy deck. Seems really good. Seems real good. All right, the next one is Will Breaker. It's three and two blue for a two, three human wizard. Whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes the target of a spell or ability you control, gain control of that creature for as long as you control Will Breaker. Only this was a legendary creature. Yeah. Uh, this thing is awesome. It's going so fast into the Tim deck because it says... Oh my god. Becomes gosh. the target of a spell or ability you control. So you just yeah. take the thing now. Uh it's just good. good. It's just really good. If you have a bunch of ways to target other creatures, because now like let's say you have, I don't know, something like uh oh any any general that targets another creature somehow, if you can put Willbreaker in there, all of a sudden it's just now stealing their stuff. Yeah, that's really powerful. I don't know. This card's great. Yeah, it seems really sick. It just seems like it's just waiting to get busted. If you just manage to get Hexproof or Shroud on it, just go to town. Go ahead and take control of the entire board. It seems like something that makes players not like EDH, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> At least, like you said, it's not a legendary creature, so that'll yeah. sort of keep it in check in some level. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Our last blue card is Sphinx's Tutelage with Alhamret on the uh, the art here. It's two in the blue for an enchantment. If you guys haven't noticed, by the way, Origins has a lot of enchantments. Yep. Which, uh, I mean, I don't know how heavily they'll play into the limited format, but I know for sure it's really good news for EDH players because that's where enchantments come to play, is our format. Um, so Sphinx's Tutelage is two in the blue for an enchantment. Whenever you draw a card, target opponent puts the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. If they're both non-land cards that share a color, repeat this process. And for five in the blue, you can draw a card, then discard a card. So this is an interesting one. It's very specific mill. Um, yeah, it's not pushed. Yeah, it's not pushed in the least bit. Yeah, I, I think Five in the blue to draw a discard when some cards just do it for free just to tap it. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty... exactly. I think this is only worth mentioning uh, just for budget people out there this effect is there's a lot of cards that do stuff like this better but mm -hmm. you know they're they may be more expensive this is definitely playable in edh because of it accrues value but it's yeah. not particularly strong agreed all right on to white yep Okay, our first white card is <sighs> this thing. Archangel of Tithes. Uh, it's a 3-5 angel with flying for 1 and 3 white, so 4 mana total. As long as Archangel of Tithes is untapped, creatures can attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays 1 for each of those creatures. So it's half of a ghostly prison or propaganda when the mm -hmm. angel's untapped. As long as Archangel of Tithes is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. So wow, it, that's so good. Well, and the interesting thing here is, it the second part doesn't say as long as Archangel of Tithes is tapped. It just says attacking. 
So yeah. if you could give it vigilance, you can have both of these things active. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, vigilance is really good on this card. Um, this sounds great. It's it does two things extraordinarily well that token decks want, which is stopping people from attacking you and then also making your attacks really effective. Yeah, really hard to block you. It's also a three five flyer for four. It's this is a really good card. Uh, you have to be in heavy white because it does cost three white, but I think mm -hmm. it's very strong. Yeah, uh, any mono white deck's gonna want this immediately just because the ability is great. As you know, there's always this uh, pattern we see, whereas if a card has a bunch of different abilities, it's usually pretty good in EDH because just versatility is so strong. So sometimes mm -hmm. you're on defense, and this is really good, and sometimes you're on offense, and this is really good. Yeah, yeah, that that's really the great flexibility of it. Is it works great on both sides of the uh, the coin there. Yep. All right, next up we got Starfield of Nyx. <laughs> this is starting to feel like a Theros block. It really is. <laughs> this is Theros art. Yeah, exactly. It's four and a white for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may return target enchantment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, that by itself is worth the price of admission because guess what enchantment people love to remove? I don't know, doubling season? Starfield yep. of Nyx just means like, get it back. Um, as long as you control five or more enchantments, each other non-aura enchantment you control is a creature in addition to its other types and has base power and base toughness, each equal to its converted mana cost. So uh, if you did have a five drop artifact, it will become a five five if you have five or more enchantments. Uh, now this does count non-aura enchantments on the battlefield. However, your non I'm sorry, this counts aura enchantments on the battlefield. So if you put, you know, double, like a I don't know, just anything Splinter Twin. Splinter Twin, et cetera. But it, it does counts change. towards your five, but it does it yeah. itself doesn't become a creature. Yeah, otherwise it would fall off the uh, creature it's yeah. enchanted to. Well, um, and also, you know, because of the bestow mechanic and because of just the Theros block in general, we now have enchantments that are also creatures. Oh, yeah. So this could bring back a creature, basically, from your graveyard every turn. Yep. Because um, it, it just has to be an enchantment. It can be an yeah. enchantment creature. Uh, so just that alone is super powerful. And you're right, just getting back your doubling seasons and your, you know, all your crazy enchantments is great, too. Yeah, this is an amazing card because it can get back enchantments. Um, however, I don't think you actually want to play this in a deck that has the second ability triggered too often because that just makes your enchantments really easily dead to a lot vulnerable. of stuff. Although yeah, super vulnerable. a full enchantment deck would maybe want this just to overrun people. Yeah, that it'd be it'd be a really interesting like what are you gonna do? Like you don't have any creatures and you play Starfield of Nyx and you're like, oh my gosh, he's attacking with a nine nine. <laughs> 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 that came out of nowhere. Um okay, the next one is Gideon's Phalanx. 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 I think I it's, it's Gideon's phalanx. whip as far as I can tell. Yeah, there's not I'm really concerned. a phalanx on this picture. Anyway. It's got two soldiers. Oh, I guess there's four more in the Isn't background. Isn't a phalanx like the big shields with the spears? Like a bunch of dudes shield blocking? I think so. Oh, no, I think it's a body of, it, according to Google, it's a body of troops or police officers standing or moving in close formation. Yeah, so I mean, usually they do the shield lock thing, like the Spartacus thing. Yeah, and but I maybe think they don't have are to... supposed to be really, I don't know, I, I think they're supposed to have a lot of people in them as well. Who knows? Either way, I, I, you know, I'm sure Wizards did their research here. I don't know. This picture does not look historically accurate. Yeah, also, they're not really, like, they look like they're just angry and walking towards something. They don't really look like they're out to... They're not marching in formation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're just kind of like, oh, let's get them. All right. Yeah, they're definitely not marching in formation. Hold on, I don't even think all their legs are... Yeah, everyone's not in the same step. The guys in the back look like they're running. It's more like Gideon, catch up to Gideon status right now. This is a travesty, Jimmy. What is this yeah. art? Uh, other than that, the art actually looks pretty good, but it's just not representative of the name. Anyway, it's yeah. <laughs> five and two white for an instant. It says, put four two two white knight creature tokens with vigilance onto the battlefield so you get eight power and toughness split into four creatures that have vigilance for seven mana it also has spell mastery which is if there are two or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn ba boom ba boom it's expensive um the effect is pretty big token decks will want this probably they run a lot of cards like this also the indestructible thing could be why you're playing it yep so a lot of times you're playing like Boros Charm and stuff like that just to protect all your tokens. Yeah. Late game, this will do that also. So I and think contribute to your board. Yeah, exactly. So I think because it it does both things is a part of the reason that that makes it totally playable in token decks. Yeah, absolutely. It's also great to just surprise block someone with Gideon's Phalanx, um, yeah. and then have them be indestructible. So like you get rid of and you can ki you can kill something that's an eight eight. Yep. 
Um, which is pretty powerful. And again, like combine it with parallel lives and doubling season and then just, you know, kill everybody. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the next one is Hallowed Moonlight. It's one in the white for an instant until end of turn if a creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast, exile it instead. And it says draw a card. So it's a cantrip that stops uh, token generation it stops or cheating. cheating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These, um, they started to make cards like this... Um, what was the other one? It was in the command. Containment Priest. Yeah, that's sort of to counter the show-and-tell type decks and the sneak attack type decks and, and mm -hmm. that stuff, the cheating stuff into play decks, uh, the creatures into play. I think this is way better than Containment Priest because it says draw a card on it. Yeah, um, although Containment Priest sits there and continues to do this effect, but... That's true, that's true. But this is... I think in Legacy, this is maybe better. I'm not sure. I don't play Legacy, but... Um, I feel like it's modern applicable because it stops the uh, the combo in um, Splinter Twin. It stops with, Collected uh, Company. It, Estermite. It stops Twin, uh, yeah. See the Unwritten. It stops Birthing Pod. Uh, Which is banned, unfortunately. Right, but it's it's legal in EDH. Um, right, right, right. It stops a lot of stuff, and, and people are forever cheating things into play. Um, it would stop something like Bribery. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's definitely a playable card. Yeah, I think it's a really fun card to hold in your hand. This definitely has a lot of power to it um, because it can stop an opponent trying to do something really big and flashy and crazy. Yeah, and, um, and like because... you said, if you're playing in a game and that's just not applicable, then you just cast it and draw a card. Yeah, and not to mention if you do this against an Eldrazi because I always find people are cheating those in. Most of the times, uh, the Eldrazi hits the graveyard and cycles back into the library because uh, they have to shuffle it. This yep. will actually exile it, so it's good oh, about that's, Eldrazi. That's very good. It, this won't stop uh, Joyra, though, everybody, because you are casting those cards. So, yeah, yeah Joyra. Yeah, Joyra. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one is, this is a reprint, but yep. it's a very good card, so we thought we'd mention it. It's uh, Knight of the White Orchid. It's a 2-2 human knight with first strike. It says, when Knight of the White Orchid enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes, planes card and put mm -hmm. it into the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So you could even find a Savannah or something with this. Yep, untapped as well. Uh, it doesn't important. say basic. Yep. yep. Comes in untapped. Or Yeah, it's uh, it's just ramp. It's yeah. White doesn't get this kind of ramp, really. Wizards is also very careful to not print abilities that just say a Plains card or a Forest card anymore. If you look at the new Nissa, it's very specific that right. it searches out the basic lands. So because it's a reprint, it, it the power level is higher because it searches out a, a Plains card. So that's that's really nice. Yeah, and that's really only relevant to us. I mean, it's probably re it's relevant in modern and stuff, but this card was already available to them. Um, yeah, exactly. And it was already available to us, but now it's just easier for you to get. Yeah, so it's a good card. It used to cost a little more. I'm sure the price is going to plummet now that in the core set. The final core set, by the way. Yep. Um, all right, next up we have Tragic Arrogance. Three and white, white, five total for a sorcery. For each player you choose from among the permanents, that player controls an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker. Then each player sacrifices all other non-land permanents he or she controls. So it doesn't get rid of lands. There's another card in the past that did that. Um, however, this is a crazy cool card. You're essentially saying, hey, you, I get to choose what lives on the entire board. Yeah, that's the thing that really makes it awesome is you're the one choosing. The other cards like this usually let the player, each player choose his own stuff, his mm -hmm. or her own stuff, I'm sorry. Um, this is you choose. So you can be like, you keep your worst creature, you keep your worst enchantment, you keep... Well, your worst planeswalker, you probably only have one. But anyway, you yeah. get what I'm saying. It's usually worst creature and then lose everything else. Yeah, uh, this card's great. Um, usually, I don't think people will have necessarily each one of these things. Right. But you can give them some crappy stuff. Like token players, like, sorry, you just get to keep one, one, one. <laughs> and also, when you're playing, I find a lot of times when I'm playing, it's like I have a card that says destroy all enchantments, but I'm like, but I want to keep one of my enchantments, you know? I want to keep that one, and so I don't really want to cast it. And this one says, oh, well, I'll destroy everybody else's enchantments, and I can still pick mine and keep mine. Yeah, I like this card a lot. Yeah. Um, the next one is Vryn Wingmare. What the heck kind of name is that? Vryn Wingmare. Uh, it sounds like Some I'm... kind of Pegasus bird yeah, thingy. Yeah, it's a, it's a two and a white for a 2-1 flying Pegasus. It's basically Thalia. It says non-creature spells cost one more to cast. Hmm. It's a hate bear, but it's a hate Pegasus. Uh, <laughs> that was my hate bear noise. It's a hate. Uh, well, this is, would be a hate mare. 
Eight minutes. Oh my goodness! You just named it. I just, unless someone else did before you I did. I just but. broke the set review. Yeah. The mics aren't working anymore. Josh, are you still there? Just I'm kidding. here. I'm here. <laughs> uh, okay. Wow, hate mayor. I love it. Not much else to say about that. Drop the mic. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good card. Um, if you want that effect, um, you know, if you're playing that kind of deck, then go for it. That was the most astute thing I've ever said in this show. Go for it, guys. Go have for fun. it, guys. Enjoy magic. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Sentinel of the Eternal Watch. Five and a white for a four, six creature giant soldier. Uh, this thing is huge, by the way. Like, if you look at the art, it's coming out of a, a castle, and it's just hanging out. Um, <laughs> if I saw this in real life, I would be so terrified. Um, uh, she has Vigilance, and also at the beginning of combat on each opponent's turn, tap target creature that player controls. Uh, very nice. Thank you, Wizards, for saying each opponent's for us. Yep. Uh, I think this card's good. Um, it, it depends on your meta. If everyone's going wide, then don't play it. But if everyone is focused on just beating down with one or two crazy things, this is a really nice way to play a lot of politics on the board as well. I just think this card is probably good regardless because even if one player is playing tokens but the other two aren't, this is a removal spell on each turn, so it scales really well too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it seems very good to me. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's not like every it. deck, but it's definitely like playable. It it's good defense. Yeah. Uh, okay, on to the multicolored cards. Very exciting. There's a lot of the good, there are a lot of good ones in this in this set actually. Yeah. So the first one or limited, I'm thinking, but yeah, there there are some good ones for EDH though. The first one we're going to talk about is Bounding Brassus. If you guys ever played the Legend of Zelda, this looks exactly like some of the creatures you have to kill. It does in, uh, in Zelda, like the little guys that jump around from platform to platform. Yeah, I, think, I hate those yeah. guys. They're I do too. Annoying. They're really annoying. They take forever. Yeah, yeah. it's uh. Okay, so Bounding Crassus is one in Simic, so one, a blue, and a green. For a Fish Lizard, 3-3. Three, three. It has Flash. It says when Bounding Crassus enters the battlefield, you may tap or untap target creature. So I'm bringing this up because there are some cards it goes infinite with. Oh, yeah. Namely, Kiki, Splinter Twin, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And so if you put this in a Teamer deck, you could do that stuff. Yeah, which is interesting because uh, Green Blue hasn't had this effect before. We've seen it in Deceiver, Exarch, and a lot of other blue creatures specifically. So adding the green here is interesting. I think it's going to try, they're trying to open up maybe some deck possibilities for uh, people to play around with that archetype. Yeah. So if uh, going infinite like that is stuff you like to do, knock yourself out. Knock yourself out. Go for it, kids. Uh, Zendikar Incarnate is the next. It's two, a green, and a bl uh, blue, not blue, sorry. Two, a green, and a red. My color. Why did I say blue instead of red? Oh, something's happening, Josh. <laughs> it's a, a creature elemental with star four. So uh, it's Zendikar's power is equal to the number of lands that you control. So this thing, no matter what, is always going to have toughness four, but it could be as big. It's usually going to be a four four, unless you ramped it out with like a soul ring or something. But it could um, often be like a 12 four. Yeah. Uh, Zenigos? 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 It just scales well, too. It's just, you know, the later the game gets, the bigger it is. Yeah, it's a good creature just in as a beater uh, creature if you're playing ramp as well. Um, if you play Animus Awakening and then this, it's going to be ginormous. Oh, yeah, that's right. Holy crap, that's a really good point. I like it. Uh, and then you get to play that other card uh, if it, if you haven't cast it yet that lets you draw cards equal to its power. Oh, no, but it's... No, it is. Yeah, 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 because it was still... Yep, uh, it's uh, state-based, right? So it would still... Yeah. Oh, that card would be really good. You might draw, look at, like... Look at us with our rules interactions. I hope we're right. Sometimes we're not. Please double-check <laughs> yeah. us. Please double-check us, guys. Um, um, nice. Next one is Shaman of the Pack. It's one, a black, and a green for a creature elf shaman. It's a 3-2. So it's an elf. When Shaman of the Pack enters the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to the number of elves you control. That sounds like a win condition. That sounds pretty good. It's just yeah. direct damage out of uh, the elf deck, and you know, especially if you're making tokens. Yeah, or um, you can flicker or bring her back or recur or whatever. Oh yeah, just, flickering her is brutal. I think that's yeah, great. You can just start offing people. Yeah, I like that. Ooh, this All right. this next one is pretty pretty bonkers. These next two are yeah. pretty bonkers, actually. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Oh, Wizards, you're doing it well. You're doing it right. We're doing on to artifacts. Doing it doing it and doing it well. Doing it well. Uh, Alhamaret's Archive, a five-drop artifact, a legendary artifact indeed. Um, if you would gain life, you gain twice that much life instead. 
Okay. So we know Aloro's the most popular general, so those people all just got happy. Yeah, uh, and everyone else is about to get happier. If you would draw a card except for the first one you draw in each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. What? What? It's like a weird reverse consecrated sphinx. It seems really yeah, it good. Requires you to requires you to draw the cards outside of your draw step. Um, this is nuts. If you have consecrated sphinx out with this, you're drawing a billion cards. This card just seems really good. Yeah, because um, there's no decks that don't have card draw. Yeah. So there's no deck that doesn't want to play this, and uh, you know, even if you like loot with this, you're drawing two cards. You know. Yeah, it seems amazing. It's really good. Oh yeah, yeah it's great with looters and it. rummagers. Mm -hmm. Really good point. Um, or or even effects like faithless looting that let you draw and then discard, um, and right. they're one time effects. Like uh, this just stacks really well with this stuff. Uh, I just think this card is going to see a lot of play in a lot of decks. Yep, it's it's going to be a card that hopefully will not cost too much because it's really only going to be EDH playable. I think. Yeah, I don't see this getting play in standard or all that. I don't know the life gain. I wonder what it does to life gain cards too. I don't know. This card, mm -hmm. this card seems pretty good. Yeah, I would say if you guys want to buy these cards, by the way, wait. Don't buy them at when the set first releases because uh, things are going to be everywhere. Usually more overpriced than they actually are, and the, the prices will dip down. And very rarely um, will the cards that you think are a steal, unless you see them and they're really cheap. But yeah, I would just avoid buying mythics and stuff for the first couple of months. Definitely the planeswalkers, I would not touch. They're gonna go. I do not touch them. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna go crazy everywhere. Yeah, they seem. Yeah, planeswalker tax is what they call it. Uh, <laughs> okay, the next one is pyromancer's goggles. I wonder whose goggles these are. There are five. <laughs> uh, Five colorless for a legendary artifact. It says tap the goggles, pay one red, or sorry, tap the goggles and add one red to your mana pool. When that mana is spent to cast a red instant or sorcery spell, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. What? It forks, but it also like gives you mana to... F what? Yeah, it's good. I knew you would like this one. Um, Actually, they're not Chandra's goggles, Josh. They're not? They belong to Jaya Ballard. What? Yeah, I was reading the the text. I hope to meet Jaya Ballard someday. I think we'd get along. Wait, how does that mean that they're Jaya's goggles? Well, if you look at her art, I think it's pretty clear they're her goggles because oh, right. they have that weird slit in the middle. Oh, I thought that was just like a cover on the yeah. goggles. <laughs> All right, my bad. My be, well, my when be. I asked that question, it wasn't rhetorical. I was actually asking. I didn't know. I was like, whose goggles are these? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for answering, Jimmy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got your back, man. Don't okay. worry. This card's insane, though. It ramps you yeah. into... Uh, it's only red instance or sorcery spells, but still, for it gives you one extra mana, and then it copies the thing. I don't know. This card seems biggity bonkers. Yeah, I like it a lot. Just being able to copy any red spell is just ridiculous once again the melic deck inner sorcery is super yeah. happy yeah yeah um so is the jive Ballard one actually yeah yeah good point yeah um next up we have hanger back walker xx uh so he uh or she or it it's an artifact creature construct that's a zero zero it enters the battlefield with x plus one plus one counters on it if you pay two mana for this then x is equal to one if you pay four mana x is equal to two etc etc when Hangerback Walker dies, put a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying onto the battlefield for each plus one plus one counter on Hangerback Walker. And then has an activated ability for one mana colorless. You can tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on Hangerback Walker. So this card is good because it scales really well. You can play it on turn two as just a 1-1. One, one, and then each turn, if you have nothing else to do with your mana, you can just slowly grow it and grow it and grow it. And eventually it blows up and creates a ton of 1-1 one, one colorless uh, thopters that fly um oh i feel like this card is it's gonna I, I think people are gonna see it and not like it as much but i think the fact that it only costs one to do its ability is really nice yeah and then it's really good in like marchesa mm -hmm. because it has one one counters and so when it dies it makes thopters and then oh no it would die when it come back into play wouldn't it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah good point it's not good in marchesa never mind but it's just one of those cards that you just get a lot of incremental value out of because like you said it scales super well there's no point at the game where it's really bad to play it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you're going to get value. Like, it's hard to, you know, it's hard. They have to exile it or something. Yeah. Oh, I should also note the uh, the card JM Die Tome is back in this set, and we use the art uh, for story time with Professor and the Wedge. 
Oh, cool. So it's funny to see it back in the set. Oh, yeah, I remember that art. That art yeah. is pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I like it. Very indicative of the professor. <laughs> yeah, it's giant books. <laughs> yeah, if that guy was dressed in like uh, as Indiana Jones, but minus the hat, then it would be exactly. <laughs> All right. The next one is Orbs of Warding. It's five mana for an artifact. It says you have hexproof, so you can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control. That seems good. And then it says if a creature would deal damage to you, prevent one of that damage. Now that sounds really small, but it's actually not. It really hoses token decks because if a token deck attacks you with 20 guys, they each deal one less damage. Yeah, it's true. It's a lot. And it just adds up over time. I really think Orbs of Warning is a very good card. Uh, also, giving yourself hexproof is strong. Mm -hmm. And it's just not like really flashy. Like, no one's, it's not going to hit the table and people are going, oh, but it's going to give you a lot of incremental value. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, the last card we're going to talk about today, we did it. Whew, take a breath. This is going to be a long episode, Ooh, Josh. Yeah, well, we'll, that's why we're only doing one this week, exactly. by the way. Exactly. Also, because of Comic Con. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sword of the Animist. It's a two-drop legendary artifact. So we've had a lot of legendary artifacts, and they're all really good, and they're all tied to the Planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a two-drop legendary artifact equipment. You can equip cost is two. So equip creature gets plus one, plus one. Whenever equip creature attacks, you may search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Whoa. Whoa. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. It just seems like this is going to get out of hand really fast because it puts it onto the battlefield. Yeah. Um, and then if you hit some, if you could hit somebody, you chances are you can hit them the next turn. Well, it's like, hey, do you want a rampant growth every single turn, guaranteed? If you have like a token deck, you just throw one creature away. Or I mean, like, chances are there's gonna be someone that you can attack that. Yeah. All you need is block. a flyer. Yeah. Yeah. This like, or a thopter, maybe. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> if you have this with the thopter spy network, then this is the artifact that's giving you the extra thopter every turn. Yeah. Yeah. I, Pretty good. Yeah, I don't think it's amazing, but it's definitely playable and it's definitely good. Yeah, I think EDH players specifically are going to like this a lot because it's just constant ramp if you're able to build around it and use it correctly. Yep. Um, all in all, this set looks very exciting for us. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not looking forward to opening some of these cards in packs uh, if I'm drafting it, but I am excited to open it so I can have it, you know, just... For my EDH decks, because a lot of these cards are not very good and limited. I wonder the limited format may have to be a little bit slow because there are a lot of like bigger type of effects, and I can't imagine they'd put that stuff in there if you just can't play them. So, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not. It seems like there's a lot of aggro strategies as well, so I'm interested to see how sealed versus limited uh, versus draft plays out. Interesting. Um, anyway, very exciting for us. Very exciting for EDH. There's a lot of stuff in here. I think green made out really, really well. Yeah, um, definitely with a lot of cool stuff. So. So did Blue. All right, don't forget, if you want to enter the book contest to uh, win a copy of the book Red Rising from Delray Books, then you need to tweet at us or email us uh, the answer to this question. What card from Magic Origins are you most excited about for EDH, and which of your decks are is it going to go into? So, yep. Then we're going to be answer. randomly choosing as well, so there's no good or bad answer. Just make sure you answer the question. Yep. And again, you're only going to have a couple days... Uh, because we do usually record on Thursday nights. So as you're listening to this right now, answer the question, get on Twitter right now and tweet it at us. Do it, do it, do it. Unless you're uh, driving, in which case pull over to the side, unless you're on the freeway, in which case exit and then pull over yeah. to the side of the road. And if you're sleeping and listening to this podcast, then you cannot tweet at us because you may not even hear what we're saying to you right wait, now. Wait, wait. Wake up! <laughs> Perfect. Actually, we should nobody if they should be used to our voice because otherwise, how could they sleep through it? So let me think of a new way. That's true. Wait, I, as an answer. I bet Wait, we got somebody. I bet we annoyed some people actually. Yeah, some people were like, "Whoa, come on, come on guys, dudes, come on, dudes." Thanks for nothing. All right, time for the end step. Everybody's the end step. favorite step that is at the end. Because it means that your turn is coming up, right? It means that my... I think it is my turn. I think you did it uh, last time. Oh, interesting. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I mean, my end step was just going to be Comic-Con and be really lame, but... <laughs> Comic-Con is... No, Comic-Con is not lame. Comic-Con's cool. Um, yeah. Mine is... It's sort of a... Well, it's a series on HBO, but it's also a YouTube channel. Both are awesome. It's Vice. So... Ice. You may have watched the, uh, they did a, a documentary, a 
a short documentary on Magic the Gathering last year. They followed uh, Russell Wilson. They talked about Magic, but they do Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson. Sorry, Jacob Wilson. <laughs> I wish they followed Russell. Russell Wilson, Wilson is a football Go player. Hawks. Jacob Wilson is a Magic the Gathering player. That'd they're be, both equally cool guys, though. They're both. Uh, yeah, they're equally cool. Wow, Jacob Wilson got a hell of an upgrade then. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry. <laughs> You're a Super Bowl quarterback of Magic, Jacob Wilson. <laughs> um, so they do really cool documentaries just about stuff that's going on in the world. Um, admittedly, a lot of their HBO stuff is really about the end, the world ending in some in a bunch of different ways, but it's still very interesting. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a super cool show. If you don't have HBO, you can find it on. Uh, you can find a lot of stuff on YouTube, although it's not all the same stuff. But I would definitely yeah. recommend checking it out. Um, yeah, they do some really intelligent pieces, yep. and um, yeah, it's really just good good reporting overall. All right, that's my end All step. Right. All right, let's move on to the cleanup step, our sister podcast. You guys can go check out the Masters of Modern at the MMCast. I guessed it on their uh, last episode, which may be two episodes back now, talking about modern and the price spikes that are going on in the format. Our editor for the show is Eli Cuevas. And special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the Living Card animations on our YouTube videos. You can find them at Living Cards MTG. That uh, that about does it for the Origins walkthrough. Walkthrough. Hey, don't forget yeah. to check out the latest episode of Commanderin, because uh, I was on that. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And we will see you next time. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>